So I finally decided to watch Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum in The Lost City. Now, I I haven't seen Sandra in anything in a while. I haven't watched the, the Bird Box and that whole thing on Netflix. I think it's on Netflix. But, you know, I like her in romantic comedies, but it has seemed like she kind of was giving them a break for a while, we'll say. <laughs> And so I have been missing the the sort of Sandra Bullock style rom-coms because she has a special formula for her her romance and comedy blend, which I like. And she, she tends to... make a mockery of the genre, which The Lost City is no exception. So in The Lost City, she plays a romance novelist who is grieving the loss of her husband while promoting her recent book release. And so she goes out on a promo tour with Channing Tatum's Uh, character. So he plays the real life model of the one of the characters that she created in her book series, or I I don't know if it's a series or I I guess it's just the recent book release, but no, it sounded like it was a series. So he's the one that she Sandra Bullock's character, Loretta Sage, she created this character and then Channing Tatum is the model of that character, but he's kind of immersed in that world of being that character. (laughs) And he has a very passionate fan base. (laughs) So the movie kind of I would say it makes a mockery of the romance genre and its readers, you know, because she's in the middle of this interview and she's as Loretta Sage, the novelist, and she is trying to be, you know, serious and talk about the inspiration behind the story and, you know, how her writing is something to be valued. I mean, she, she takes it seriously, (laughs) but when you look at the audience, it's filled with a bunch of women who came to see, I can't even remember his name, but Dash, something Dash. I think he was just called Dash which is Channing Tatum's character. I mean, these women, it's, it's just nothing but women in the audience, which perpetuates the, well, I, I, I can't call it an assumption. I guess it is a presumption that the romance genre is digested mostly by female readers. So, I mean, yeah, but the audience is just, it's all women, okay? All women in the audience, and they didn't even come to see the novelist. They came to see the model. (laughs) They came to see uh, Dash, right? So, Loretta Sage, the title of her latest release is, I think it's The Lost City of D., And the comedy in this film is, it's almost like crypto feminist satire. I don't know. (laughs) Because they clearly are making a mockery of the romance genre, but also trying to show the behind the scenes of the romance genre to point out that it's not 
the glamorous, kind of sexualized image that we, the public, might have about the genre. And she really is trying to... <laughs> she, she's kind of got her pitchfork out and she's like really trying to prove to people that she should be taken seriously as a writer. And then she gets kidnapped because, you know, th- this movie, I will tell you, is filled with... <laughs> filled with cliches. So she gets kidnapped by this very eccentric billionaire who takes her story a little too literally. (laughs) And so he kidnaps her because he wants her to find the lost ancient city that she fictionalized in her novel so that he can find this lost treasure he imagines will be there. (laughs) So she's trying to figure that out. And then, you know, Channing Tatum, his character is trying very hard to be taken seriously as a man and not just this sexy, attractive cover model. So he sets out to rescue Loretta Sage, you know, so that he can prove that he's not just a pretty face, you know. (laughs) And that goes... mm, It it goes. (laughs) So I will say Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum, their chemistry was good. Now, I was surprised to see Brad Pitt in this film, and I read that Sandra Bullock, she just, it sounded like it was spontaneous, that they wrote his character into the story because Sandra Bullock and Brad Pitt, they were working together on his film. I think it was a portrait of a thief or something like that. It's another film that's coming out this year. And so they were working together on it and they immediately became friends. It sounds like they hit it off. And so she just asked him if maybe he could make a, an appearance, a cameo appearance in her film, you know, (laughs) and he agreed to it. And I must say it was so, refreshing to see Brad Pitt in this way because I mean again the whole thing it it kind of feels satirical and I'm I'm assuming that's how they wanted it to be interpreted but Brad although he has been in some comedies he's I remember him in a Will and Grace episode and I think, was he on SNL? I don't know. But he's done a couple of things. But generally, we don't see him this way. So it's, he's kind of, I don't want to say laughing at himself, but I think he's really putting (laughs) a dark eye on his image of being, you know, this sex symbol and, you know, every, all the ladies love him. But, at the same time, he's, he's getting up there in age, so he's now having to, you know, pass that title down to the next younger fella, you know, I guess like Harry Styles or somebody, I don't know. But, you know, he's kind of making a mockery of his pretty boy legacy, I think. But it's not so over the top. So he plays this guy who knows how to find people, and when... Loretta said she gets kidnapped. Dash, he turns to Brad Pitt's character to, you know, find out where she is because, again, he's he's got to prove himself. And so he needs to rescue her. So he's her knight on in shining armor, I guess, you know, <laughs> without the armor, you know. But so... Brad Pitt, I was surprised by his character, but I really did enjoy it. And so after 
after watching this film, which I would say is a little bit too long, but after watching it, I then was thinking about romantic comedies in general. And I noticed that, you know, maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe we, the audience, is overreacting. But it seems like, you know, Hollywood kind of, they pulled the plug on romantic comedies. Or maybe they're just not making good ones and so it's not sticking in my mind. Because I know Jennifer Lopez did one, I can't think of the name of it, but you know, hers are kind of hit or miss. But, and then um, there was, I saw there was another remake of The Father of the Bride, but I think it has like a Cuban spin on it. But I don't know if that's in theaters. I think it's like on a streaming service or something. That one might be fun. I might check that out because it, it at least has something different. <laughs> I mean, because The Father of the Bride has been remade multiple times. But if I am remembering correctly, I think it was a Cuban spin or some, some Spanish kind of spin on it because it stars... Uh, Andy Garcia and Gloria Estefan. So I, I'm, there was something there, you know, that made it different. So I might check that out, but it does seem like they're not popping out too many romantic comedies these days. And then I stumbled upon this Vanity Fair list. So they ranked, I think it's 33 movies. So it's the 33 best romantic comedies of all time. And okay, so I haven't seen all of the films on this list, but most of them I have seen. I was surprised to see how low (laughs) How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days ranked. It's on here, but I think it's like 29 or something. And, okay, so the half of it is something I never even heard of, but that that is at the end of the list, number 33. But you got my fat, what is that? My fat Greek, my big fat Greek wedding. Um, and something's got to give. I mean, there, there's some that are familiar and some that are not so familiar, like Defending Your Life. Although that was written by Albert Brooks, who, you know, he's pretty well-known and accomplished as a writer, producer, actor, all of that. So, you know, but I was, okay, so How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days is number 28. Now, I'm just surprised that it ranked that low, but... Okay, and then you have some classics on here that are like really old, you know. (laughs) There's His Girl Friday, The Apartment, which is one of my favorites with uh, Shirley MacLaine and I can't think of his name. Oh, shoot. Jack Lemmon, I think. That's his name. (laughs) It was going to annoy me, but okay, so that's who is in the apartment. And that one I love because there's so much conversation. Like there's a lot of talking in that film, but I think because you're watching two people form a relation, a relationship naturally, I think that's what I really love about that film. But you have that, uh, Annie Hall is on here, number 26. There's there's some that I am familiar with and there's some not so much. And then there's some that I'm like, I didn't know they were. <laughs> they were uh, a considered a romantic comedy. But okay. So I wonder why they have Shirley MacLaine in bold, but not Jack Lemmon. Okay. So anyway, (laughs) 
And then you have your usual rom-com participants, right? You got Julia Roberts. Meg Ryan is all over this. Uh, You got Hugh Grant, of course. Where would we be without Hugh? (laughs) Now, the 40-year-old virgin is on here, and I completely forgot that. It is a rom-com, so I'm not detesting that. I'm not in any way. (laughs) It's just the comedy, I think, is so high quality that you forget there is a romance. Oh goodness. But yeah, so they got black and from black and white films all the way to current day films are on here. But I must say, their top five list. I <laughs> so coming to America is number eleven, which you know, okay. I mean, I, I'm I'm gonna leave it alone. <laughs> I will leave that alone. But their top five Now, I don't disagree with most of it, so let me give you the top five. There is 10 Things I Hate About You that starred Julia Stiles, and I can't think, was that, what was the guy? I can't think of his name. Heath? Was it Heath? I wish they would, like, use bold print when they're naming people, but I think it was, yeah, it says, okay, here it is, Heath Ledger. So yes, it was Julia Stiles in the late Heath Ledger who starred in that, and that is a good one, so yeah, that that's a classic. I wouldn't disagree with that. Then you have Bridget Jones' Diary, which is, of course, Renee Zellweger and Colin Firth and again Hugh Grant (laughs) isn't he in this one yes he's in this one (laughs) I'm starting to question myself like maybe I don't know but I don't see his name see that's the but yeah he's 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 kind of the bad guy in here you know the bad boy but um he's like an intellectual bad boy (laughs) I don't know. There's something unique about his bad boy persona, you know? But anyway, so you got that. And then you have Clueless, number three. And then you have You've Got Mail, number two. And When Harry Met Sally is number one. Now, I mean, (laughs) I'm guessing because of the infamous diner scene, of course, we have to give when Harry met Sally the crown, okay? So, I mean, I I think I like You've Got Mail. I, I think I would favor that over When Harry Met Sally. But I get, I mean, that scene, can't nobody top that. So, I get it. <laughs> and, yeah, so it's number two in number one slot. I'm okay with that. We're not going to argue over that. But number three, (laughs) let's make our way back to number three, which is Clueless, starring Alicia Silverstone. Oh, I didn't even realize Paul Rudd was in this. I'm not even sure if I saw this movie, but number three, Are we really giving that the number three slot? I mean, okay. So, and it was, I mean, it absolutely is a classic because everyone talked about it. It also led to the TV show, Clueless. And, you know, I mean, it inspired a generation in... I would say like the young adult genre of comedy. It it definitely was. <laughs> um, I don't want to say. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I would say it, it was copied heavily in subsequent films and TV and books. I don't know 
know what was this an adaptation or not, but let me see if the article mentions it. I don't think it was, but I'm not. Okay, so it, it, yeah, it doesn't say, I'm not sure if it was a book or not. Okay, but it does say that it's a take on Jane Austen's Emma. So writer, director, Amy Heckerling, this was, you know, from her mind, kind of a a teenage spin on that. I I don't know really what Emma is, but anyway, (laughs) I mean, I haven't, I don't think I've seen this film, but I just, I I found it odd. It was number three, (laughs) but I mean, it was heavily influential So, I mean, I guess, (laughs) I guess it it deserves that spot. I I mean, when I think of all the others on this list, Clueless was one of a kind. Even though I haven't even seen it, I don't think, or at least I don't remember. But because of the way it it influenced the culture, I guess we'll leave that alone. So (laughs) we will leave that alone. I digress. But anyway, it was quite interesting. And I see here they have Groundhog Day on here now. That was number seven. But anyway, this is an interesting list. And I wonder why they picked 33. That's such a such an odd number. <laughs> but okay. Anyway, yeah, you should check it out if you like romantic comedies. I think we don't appreciate them the way we should, but we have been entertained with many classics that we still watch today. I mean, some of these movies are like 50, 60, 70 years old, you know, the apartment that was 19... 60, I think it said, or, no, 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 it couldn't have been 1960. It's black and white. I think it said 1940. So that's like 80 years old. <laughs> I mean, some of these movies, they just, they don't die, you know, they just don't die. And my best friend's wedding, that's 25 this year. I didn't even realize that. But anyway, it's a fun list just to read. Um, I don't agree with, you know, everything on here. And of course, it's mostly white and heteronormative. But, and I guess that's why they went and (laughs) added that Netflix one because it is queer. Just so people don't say nothing. (laughs) But most of the list, I mean, it's heteronormative American films. So there's that. (laughs) But are we surprised? But anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for listening and watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have, please give it a like, a comment. Let me know if you took a look at the list. Well, what are your thoughts on this list of 33 romantic comedies? What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? (laughs) And if you are not yet subscribed, please consider subscribing to my channel. I post videos every week usually about film and books, films and books. But yeah, I'm going to get out of here again. Thank you for listening and watching, and I will catch you in the next one. 
Bye.